See, the Holy Spirit is upon us, watch this, to protect God's investment in us. There's a scripture, notice this scripture, James 4, verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, watch, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit has come to possess all that the blood has bought. The blood bought all of you. The blood said, all of you are mine. The blood said, every piece of you belongs to me. The Spirit of God will not rest until he possesses every piece of us that the blood has bought. Number three, the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee. Ephesians 1, 14, he is the guarantee of our inheritance. I love this. Anybody ever have these wild thoughts? What if this is just a big joke? Oh, maybe you don't. I do. What if maybe this is just a big joke. Maybe God's not who he says he is. Maybe, maybe when it's all said and done, it's just going to be this big, cruel thing we want. No, what? The Bible says the, way we, the reason we know that's not true, you ready, is because he gave us the Holy Spirit a promise that is the guarantee of God's intent toward us. That however good you might think it is now, it is just a down payment of what will be. See, he secures us in this life and assures us of the good things yet to come. That's what the Spirit does. He is a guarantee of our inheritance. Until what? The redemption of the purchased possession. Who's that? That's us. He redeemed us. We were purchased by his blood. Now watch this. It says, it says that, that the Holy Spirit is going to keep doing this in our lives until, until we step into the fullness of being his redeemed possession. The Holy Spirit is so powerful. and so awesome. So... Let me just finish with this. What does the blood do that allows the Spirit to anoint? What does it do? I mean, the blood was put on first and then the oil on top of that. Making a prophetic statement that the Spirit will anoint what the blood is cleansed. So, what does the blood do that allows that to take place. Let me give you this. Number one, the blood speaks. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 24. Listen, I have spent hours and years since I began to discover the courts of heaven meditating on this. It says that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, and we have come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See, the blood speaks. That means it's giving testimony for you. It's, it's giving testimony in your behalf. How do I know that? Because it talks about it's speaking, the sp blood of sprinkling is speaking better things than that of Abel. Well, we know that Genesis 4, 9 through 11, that, that Cain killed Abel. And God said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. He said, I'm my, bro my brother's keeper. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So watch. The testimony of Abel's blood calls God to judge Cain. You got to get that. So if, if there is a blood of sprinkling speaking better things than Abel, here's what it means. It means that the blood of Jesus is not testifying against us so that we would be judged. It is testifying for us that we might be forgiven and that we might be completely redeemed. It is speaking. Notice, 
It's not something that spoke. It's something that is speaking. It's speaking for you. This is important if you're going to receive a mantle. If you're going to receive the anointing oil. Why? Because, because you have to know that the blood is so speaking in your behalf that there is no longer a legal voice against you demanding your judgment. There is instead a voice crying out for your redemption. Now that blood is speaking in two places. It's speaking, first of all, in the heavenly realm are the courts. In Leviticus 16, verses 14 through 16, when Aaron would go behind the veil one time a year, it tells us what he would do, some of what he would do. It says he will take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the goat, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sin. So he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So Aaron would sprinkle the blood in the most holy place. Now in Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, the Bible says, if you will, that the tabernacle that Moses built was a replica of what he had seen in heaven. See, the Bible says that the temple of God was open and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. In other words, when Moses went up into the mountain, the dimensions and all the awareness that he had was because he was looking at the real thing in heaven and God says, I want you to come build a replica of it in the earth. So watch. When Jesus died on the cross, he took his blood into that real one in heaven. This is why he said to Mary, don't touch me. Because he, had not, he said, I have not yet ascended to my God and to my Father. He said, if you touch me, you're going to defile the offering. Don't touch me. Because later he would tell them, touch me. He would tell Thomas, put your hand here and put it into my side. Why? Because he had already been to heaven and had sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat. That blood is speaking for us today. It has been speaking for over 2,000 years. Watch. Giving God the legal right to forgive us. 